Hey everybody in Serial Killer Country. My name is Brittany Ransom. And my name is Brian Joyner. And this is When Killers Get Caught, a podcast devoted to deep dives into the lives and psyches of the killers we love to learn about. Each week we'll discuss something new and interesting in the serial killer world, and then we'll discuss one well-known or lesser-known killer, go deep into their childhood, lives, methodology, and most importantly, how they got caught. And then, because most serial killer fans love a little spook, Brian will lead us down the road of the paranormal into something that he found to be particularly creepy this week. But before we get into that, now, we were supposed to watch the Mormon murder documentary this okay, week on Netflix. Okay, but we we watched two episodes. Two out of three is not bad. We watched like an episode and a half. Okay, well, I watched two episodes. I did not watch the other half of the episode because there is a man on this documentary who has, I would, a soft, pillowy voice, and I go to sleep every time he starts talking. I'm sure, like, I'm sure there's something wrong with his throat. It has to be something. Like, he some... just has a really soft, delicate, like, it's really nice voice. It's not bad. Yeah, no, it's not. It's just, if I'm already tired and he starts talking, I'm like, oh, that sounds good. <laughs> and then I'm out. It's like, listen to Markiplier or you. Oh, my God. So, because when I watched it during the daytime, I was like, oh, this is super interesting. So we're going to try and finish it by next week. And then we can give you our opinion on the fact that um, the Mormon religion is a trip. It is a real trip. I already told you this. It's well, a trip. I didn't even know it was a cult until about a month ago. Until you were like, <laughs> it is definitely a cult, Brittany. I'm like, no, this is just like spicy Christianity. No. And you were like, no. It's more like, okay, it's, uh, Mormonism is kind of like Scientology. Yes, which I did it's, not, I, I totally pulled it up while we were on the phone and it was like, was visited by an alien who gave him these. Okay, first of all, he's an angel. His name is Moroni. Sorry, visited by <laughs> an angel who oh, brought wait, him wait, these wait, wait, plates. Wait. No, it wasn't an angel. It was a white salamander. Hold on. Oh, right. That's <laughs> that's what caused all the bombings that someone insinuated that oh it was actually God. not an angel. It was a white salamander. And what? that made people really upset. And then like four people got blown up. So... <laughs> But no, it was three. I think three people got blown up, and then there was the potential for a fourth bomb to go off. There was another one that was going to go off, but the third one, I, you got to watch the second one because it explains everything. I about missed the first one of the episode. bombs. All right, then. You, you no, know, you just got to um, look. You got to watch it. <laughs> I will. I will. I will. Just not in the like not late night. Can't do it. Okay. I'll fall right asleep. So instead, I guess the topical thing we're going to discuss this week is. Uh, the Kendrick Johnson case that has been reopened. Yes. And for people who don't know, uh, Kendrick Johnson was a teenager who was found dead inside of a vertically rolled up mat in the gymnasium of his high school in Valdosta, Georgia in 2013. A preliminary investigation autopsy concluded that it was an accidental death. And people said that he had crawled into the mat to seek i guess the the a lot of the boys like to hide their stuff there instead yeah. of going to their lockers yeah a lot of kids like to put their shoes or backpacks and stuff into these because this was a second mats. gym not the <laughs> main gym where they did like gym class and stuff yeah and they would store their stuff there because it was closer to their classes than their actual lockers exactly uh, and also, I guess the boys also shared shoes sometimes. So they yes. would like share like an expensive pair of shoes and they would drop the basketball shoes off at the gym and then put their regular shoes back on and go back to class. Yeah, I didn't know that I was mean, a thing. Listen, and, shoes are like $500. Well, these these like, fancy shoes are like $500. So I understand. Like, I guess like I didn't have that many friends. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have friends to share um, shoes with when I was in high school. But regardless, uh, after this happened, it was a big thing. A lot of people were like, how is this possible? Um, I use the same kind of mats that they use at my job. We use them when we do gym gymnastics class with the kids. Right. And we're trying to figure out like how a like 170 pound, 17 year old boy fit in that um, with no one being able to see him. And he was there for days, mm -hmm. um, which also, you know, I it mean, the parents question, filed a wrongful death suit against uh against 38 different people who worked at the school and the the community uh, for a hundred million dollars um they originally said like this is definitely murder and y'all are pushing it under the rug yeah yeah uh i believe there is 
there are two students at the school who have family members who work for the feds. And there was a belief that perhaps those boys had something to do with this. And they got it covered up. And that was covered up because they have parents in a uh, higher level law enforcement. Right. But regardless, it's, it's being looked into again because I mean, we thought we had heard the last of it in 2016 when the department of justice said, we're ac- not looking into this. It was an accidental death. Yeah. They said it was an accident. We're not looking into this. Um, I mean, this was eight years ago. Do you remember? I don't, I don't remember how long ago it, it was like a few years ago. So there's this black woman. Mm-hmm. She was at a a friend's uh, party sleepover and, you know, everybody's drinking and stuff. In Chicago? I think it was. I think so. She wandered off while she was drunk and she ended up in a freezer, somehow locked inside of it? No. No, not that one. Oh, that one was weird. They were, she was at like a hotel party and she went off with somebody who we don't know who they are based on the cameras and then like her mom called the police. They were like, oh, she hasn't been missing long enough. And days later, they were able to discover that she was on a floor where they were doing construction in a freezer. And I'm like, this is so suspicious. And where's this at? I think this happened in Chicago a couple years ago. Wow. Definitely in the past decade. This no, is another one of those weird. The one I'm talking about, it. Pro- I think it happened either in Florida mm-hmm. or Texas. Okay. She was at a, like, a friend's party. You know, she's a co-worker of this friend. Mm-hmm. And she goes over to this like birthday party or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I forget the name of, I forget her name. I apologize. But, um, you know, she spends the night because, you know, they've been drinking and stuff. Right. Next morning, everybody in the house finds her out dead and alone. The front lawn of their condo or wherever. Was it cold or she was just dead? She was dead. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you, you haven't heard of that one? No, I don't remember that one. Oh, goodness. And they said that was probably an accident on it because she probably fell off the balcony from the. It'd be really obvious if she had fallen off of the balcony. Yeah, I had to she look this She would have up. sustained I... several uh, broken bones I... and li- ligature marks. I think she didn't. There, there weren't a lot, and that's what made it like very Confusing, suspicious. Yeah. Yes. And I got to look it up and see who the heck this. Oh, goodness. But yeah, apparently the the Newark County Sheriff says that the death initially ruled an accident should be investigated again. Um, This is, I mean, his parents have never given up. Um, I wouldn't. Of course, who would? Um, The, yeah, I mean, they, uh, accidental, like positional asphyxia is a horrible way to go. Yeah. Um, and I just, I guess I don't even understand like the way, like how were they storing their shoes inside of the bats? That doesn't even make any logical sense to me. If like they, I would have hidden them behind the mats, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, an autopsy conducted by an external pathologist that his family ordered said that he did also uh, experience some blunt force trauma to his head, which is another thing that they believe was made it more suspicious, like that somebody hit him and then somehow he ended up upside down in the thing. I mean, that could be a thing. I mean, the second one, I mean, someone could have just, you know, killed him outright and then just stuffed him in there because. But apparently this is an uphill battle for this sheriff because apparently his office has received 17 boxes of written and electronic evidence from the federal probe. 17. 17. So he has a lot of stuff to go through interviewing over a hundred people, tens of thousands of emails and text messages between the young people reviewing uh, hundreds of hours of surveillance videos from the high school. Um, all this between January 10th to the 11th, 2013. Um, he has a lot. His name is Polk. Uh, he has a lot of, on his plate in reopening this case. But I, I hope the family gets some kind of a answer that feels better for them. Yeah. A lot of times when there is pressure on a police department to get an answer, I worry that 
they are just picking the first answer, the easiest answer, instead of, you know, it's not like TV. Yeah. In TV, yeah. it's like, oh, we can spend all this time focusing on this one case. I mean, here, it's it's June 2013. Mm-hmm. The whole world is aware of what happened here. And the pressure is on them to figure out what happened, figure it out quickly, and close this case so that everybody in the world is not looking at Valdosta, Georgia, and shaking their head at this. That's funny. Okay, so I, I did find the name mm-hmm. of the woman in... So it was 2018 is when okay. this happened. Wow. And, and guess what? It was in Georgia. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so Tamla Horsford. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Okay. Yeah, she was attending a friend's adult sleepover birthday party or something like that. And they found her dead in the backyard. I, I will admit. So we used to have what we called adult sleepovers in college. <laughs> and it was also because we had been drinking. Uh, well, uh, and here, but here's what we would do, right? Okay, so here was our, our major plan. We would go and we would pregame at like a restaurant that had like a good deal on um, booze. Of course. Then we would come back and we would do our makeup and that was a whole ordeal. And I would do everybody else's makeup for them. Oh and we would go God. back out and then we would come back and we'd end up like laying on somebody's floor in somebody's house You just talking. Don't. At like two in the morning, so I mean, this is not that crazy. What she went to, she went to like a little, you know, little grown up slumber party. Yeah, she was the, only the black downside person there. is that she died. Yeah, she was the only black person there too. So. Ooh, okay. Well, <laughs> I got feelings about that. <sighs> um, but yeah, isn't that weird that like we're expected to be okay about that? Entering into an environment where there's nobody like you. It's it's weird. It's definitely it, it does feel a little uncomfortable, not gonna lie. Because I feel um, like in any other situation, like if you put like just one random Caucasian person in a room with no one like them, they would feel very uncomfortable. Mad real world. Have you seen Dave Chappelle? I uh, I have seen Dave <laughs> Chappelle. This, this I just don't show? remember that one. But it, yeah. This is one of his skits of Mad Real World. They put uh one you know how they, how he made a joke of saying how they always put this one black guy in this house of all these like six different white oh, people. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and, yeah, and you put one white guy in this house with some a uh, bunch of black people. Let's see how that works out. It didn't work out really well. I do remember this. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's just it's an interesting thought process that you're expected to do. Like that's the norm. Like, I mean, to be honest, really I honest mean, we right now, are minorities, but um, yeah, but like anytime I'm I'm out with my friends Mm -hmm. or you know hanging out with people Mm -hmm. i just subconsciously i just look around i have to look around and make sure like is there another person that looks like me oh absolutely (laughs) is there somebody here who has my back somewhere Mm -hmm. but like it's just like it's a thing i mean well it's also one of those things you know uh, we talk about a lot of crimes where women are the victims yeah um people are just like yeah you should do this thing or you should do that thing and i'm like do you understand the like unconscious level of checking that i do all the time like in the last podcast i mentioned to you that i if i get off the elevator with somebody on right, my floor and yes. uh, i wait or there was one night uh i dropped off like my trash at the trash mm-hmm. chute mm-hmm and uh there was another guy who like walked in after me and after he like like he asked me like some really awkward questions mm. um like and i was just like i'm taken and he was just like he kept asking questions and i was like nope that's it we're done here and then like my brain went you know what i should do right now i'm going to step into the the uh stairwell mm-hmm. and so i instead of going directly to my because you know my right. instead of going directly to my door which is right there yeah i dipped over to the little hallway over there and i turned and went into the stairwell and i waited and i was like how long do i have to wait here to make sure that he has moved on because <sighs> the last thing i want is for him to know where i live yeah and that shit is we already live on the same floor i don't want him to know exactly what room i live in that like what true. apartment i live in so that so that's things that people don't recognize when they're a part of the dominant group, like how much stuff you do to make sure you are in a good place. Right. Yeah. God. 
Ugh. You know, just subconscious stuff you grow up, you learn to do. Yeah, this is true. This you know, is true. like it's very dark outside right now. I Daylight don't. Savings time is over, though. That's true, but I don't walk outside <clears throat> in the dark. This is yeah, really ever. I mean, look, get, okay, I'm going to be honest again. When I'm walking from your apartment to my car, <laughs> you're a little nervous. Just a little bit. It's very dark on some of those side streets. And I'm just like, let me, where's my keys at? Let me find those real quick. Put those between my fingers. <laughs> what, you need one of my, uh, your my little, uh, your self defense keychains? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But not yeah. lying, not not lying. Oh my god. Well, I I listen. I wish Sheriff uh, Sheriff Polk all the the yeah all good the feelings in the world, good vibes to you, sir. Yeah, he's got luck. a long investigation in front of him, and the thing is, no one's gonna be happy depending on the outcome of this. Yeah. Because if he finds out it was murder, then a whole nation will be enraged. <sighs> if he does this whole huge investigation and he finds that it was an accidental death. A whole nation of people will be upset with him. I mean, it's, so. it'll be the same outcome if they find it's an accidental death, though. So yeah, but there's they'll just have more closure and just be, they'll, I mean, there'll be still answers as in to why, but other than that, there's not much you can do about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, in our quest to continue looking for more international people. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned in our trailer that we recorded, uh, I have a huge master list of every serial killer who has ever been caught since roughly like 1900 across the entire world. And they're organized by country. And then there's a whole subset of America because we have so many. But generally, the rest of them are organized by country. So it's just like, you know what? I haven't looked at India ever. No. So I started like typing in names. And when I typed in this woman's name, I came across a book called The Bandit Queen of India, an Indian woman's amazing journey from peasant to international legend. That's an awesome title. Right. It's and still, when you see a title like that. You got to buy it. No matter what the story is about, you got to buy it. Can't ignore it. And, you know, I expected to find a woman who was a hero, but actually she was kind of an anti-hero. Uh, Deadpool go. And I'm not exactly bothered by the fact that she killed over 20 men. You will find out why as we journey into this tonight. Okay. Um, unlike my usual subject of serial killers, um, this woman, Fulan Devi, qualifies more as like a spree killer slash revenge killer. Um, and this is a woman who went from being born a peasant to becoming a bandit to a victim to a killer to an activist and politician. I'm here for the banditness. Oh yeah. I'm very excited to tell her story because I'm I'm not sure that too many people know about her and just what a life. That's a, a real arc right there. <laughs> but like I do with every week, I talk about the beginnings of these um we'll call them uh infamous people. There you go. Not all amazing, but infamous. So uh, Fulan Tavi was born August 10th, 1963, in a small village called Gura Kapura in Uttar Pradesh, which is, we would look at it like states, okay. so different states in India. She was the fourth child of parents Debbie Din and Mula. She was born into the Malan caste. The Malan are traditional boatmen and fishermen tribes and communities in North and East and Northeast India, as well as Pakistan. Uh, for folks who don't know, India has operated in a social stratification system called a caste system since about 1500 BC. It is one of the world's oldest forms of social stratification and is based on people's work and their duty. Hmm. Upper and lower castes, specifically in the area that I'm talking about today, uh, lived in segregated colonies where they didn't even share water resources. And like many social systems like this, it offers privileges to the upper caste and sanctions and repression of the lower caste by the more privileged groups. Uh, despite being criticized globally and also within India for being an unjust system, it's remained virtually unchanged, trapping people into this fixed social order where they can almost never escape. 
Um, and the caste that uh, Fulan was born into, the Malin caste, the, the, it's so low in down in the totem pole that the only people like below her are referred to as the untouchables. Oh. They are seen as like kind of the scum of the earth. Oh. Yeah. So she she was not the lowest, but pretty far down there. She, she was close. Um, as a member of that lower caste, she was very, very poor. Her family had one asset, a one acre farm with a large old neem tree on it. It's a specific type of tree only grown in India called mm. neem. Um, and her father's plan was to harvest the wood from that tree to be able to pay for a dowry for his several daughters to marry off. Really? Is it that like rare of a tree? It's not so much as that that people need lumber. Okay. And they're all broke. Um, he had actually inherited 15 acres from his parents when they died, but his brothers pretty much stole it from him. Um, one of Fulan's cousins, his name was Mayadin, was a very well-connected man and aided in that land thievery. Uh, her uncle had been doing everything to slowly take this land away from the family. Mm. So when Fulan was 10, she had had enough. <laughs> of course. She demanded that her father fight for the land as it was the only thing that the family had. But her dad didn't have much in the way of like socio-political capital. And he was honestly weary after a years long fight with his family over this property. Her uncle had taken it over just through pure dishonesty and it had left Fulan's family in, like, more poverty than other people in their community. Oh. So Fulan decides she's had enough. And she confronts her cousin Mayadin. So she begins publicly calling him a thief and attacking him when she sees him. Then she conv convinces her sister and some other girls from town to do a sit-in at the tree. The name tree on their property. And this was like, it lasted for a significant period of time. Really? She's 10 years old, right? She's 10 years old. <clears throat> and she wouldn't leave when even some of the elders of, of the community tried to drag like the girls home. Mm. It only ended because Mayadin showed up and he hit her with a brick, what? knocking her unconscious. Dude, come on. <laughs> Yeah, this is a, a, a weird blood feud that's going to continue on for quite some time. Oh, my God. So after that event, uh, I Maiden kind of stops for a little bit, at least publicly. Um, Fulan still hates his guts and refers to him as the thief whenever she can in public, which is uh, not a good thing to be just yelling at someone in the streets, is even it, now. That they're a thief? I mean, yes. But they're a thief, though. Yes, Maiden was a thief, but um, <laughs> well, so for about a year, he kind of keeps his mouth shut. Nothing publicly is happening, but on the back end, he is finding a way to rid himself of Fulan. Of the ten year old girl? Oh, I mean, now she's eleven. Yeah, this is eleven year old girl. Oh my god! He finds a more well off man who'd agree to take her as his bride. Uh. Her family accepted, as was the custom at the time. And this worked out for Mayadin because this this new husband didn't live very close to her family. The only problem is that he was in his 30s and Fulan was 11. Mm -hmm. His name was Puri Lal. And um, in her autobiography, she calls him a man of very bad character. Which I feel like she was being very uh, kind yeah, I was in saying, this description. I mean, a 30-year-old marrying an 11-year-old? I mean, uh, Yes. Yes. Yeah, Putty mistreated her from the beginning, sexually assaulting her and beating her from the start. Uh, and this was pretty rough because she's away from home like well over an hour. Like it's not it's, this wasn't a she could just walk home situation. Mm -hmm. She was hours away from home in a very rural area. Um, she was isolated and but she did try and run away from her husband several times. And every time she was returned back to him, he would beat her more savagely. Finally, she was returned to her family because her husband was like, she's too young for wifely duties. No shit. Why'd you marry her in the first place? Yeah. 
<laughs> I have words to say, but I'm trying Yeah, I to... knew you were going to have feelings about this. <laughs> um, but three years later, at 14, they return her to her husband. It's 1977. Mm. She kicked up a huge fuss this time. She protested and her husband brought her back to her family's home. The problem was 1977, rural India, a wife leaving her husband in this manner is considered very taboo. And her community marked her as a social outcast almost immediately. So she's already one of these people of a lower caste. Um, She has someone with some political clout, very angry with her. Mm Mm-hmm. And now she's being deemed like an unfit woman and a social outcast. Like she's just getting dug further into the, like hammered further into the ground. Of course. Okay. But now fully back home, Fulan is back on, I can only say back on her bullshit. Back on her uncle hating Uh bullshit. Uh huh. Cause she is back to bothering her cousin about the fact that you stole 14 acres from us. She will not let it go. She accuses him of stealing the land. She tries to take him to court on her own at 14 years old. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, she loses the case in 1979 when she's 16. Um, what the, that, that case lasted two years, though. Yo, she was... Listen... Fulan was just, like, as a child, a force to be reckoned with. Nice. <laughs> so then Maiden comes up with a new plan. He calls some of his police buddies. And he accuses Fulan of stealing things from his house. Um, She gets put in jail for three days where she is beaten and raped by guards in the prison. <clears throat> It was at this time in her life that she developed a bit of a hatred towards men. Understandable. Uh, Specifically men who abused women and also a serious distrust of the justice system. Absolutely understandable. When she was released from prison, her family and community shunned her for being a thief, even though she never stole anything. And for a time in her life, she just felt really helpless. So before I get into what I can only refer to as the bandit era of Fulan's life, I have to give you some backstory here. In India, they have a different name for gangs. They call them the Dacoit. And there's a long storied history about why they even exist in India. But they are a part of organized and sometimes disorganized crime in several areas of India, with some being very traditional gangs. Uh, You know, they have protection schemes they are just going around causing a ruckus. We have some that are very Robin Hood esque. Oh, okay. You know, rob the rich, give to the poor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like that. some of the Robin Hood ones would target wealthy people and then pay the medical bills or weddings of poor people. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. Uh, other Dequite were like the mob in the 20s. They targeted businesses, offered protection, that sort of thing. Mm. Though the most common kind of Dequite actually kidnapped wealthy people and the de- demanded ransom money from their wealthy relatives. I mean, they give them back though, right? Uh, if they got their money. Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, those are kind of Robin Hood-esque. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> Just edgy Robin Hood. There you go. Um, there's a bit of a dispute here in some of the texts. So in Fulan's book, she says that she was kidnapped by a Dacoit gang. But in a different biography I looked at, they posed it as Fulan walked away from her life with her family because there was nothing there for her anymore. Hmm. But either way, she's 18. It's uh, 1979. And now she's with this gang. Um, the leader, his name is Babu Gujar, expresses a desire to rape her. But she has been offered protection by Vikram Mala, um, the second in command, who is of the same caste as her. Uh, Babu was of a higher caste, which is why he felt like he had Mm. the ability to just do whatever he wanted. Right. I'm like, I'm going to let you know this. I want to do this to you. And it might. Yeah. He's just like, just letting you know, like, yeah, you and me. I'm doing that later. Whether you want to do it. Oh, my God. I'm doing it. Well, uh one night he. comes to try and rape her and Vikram kills him and assumes the 
position of being the new leader of the gang. Fulan is like, this is awesome. <laughs> He's like, you really have my back. Thanks. Yep. And she's like, you know what? I have no problem becoming your second wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. She's like, listen, I'm good. Like, this is, um, you got to figure though, like, Vikram is probably the only man in her life who hasn't harmed or like seriously neglected her. Right. That's true. And he was honest with his his um word. He did protect her. Yeah. He said, listen, I got your back, honey. So uh, it's not that crazy that she would become emotionally attached to the only man who's really put up, like really fought for her. Yeah. Yeah. So to take that a step further... Fulan tells him about her ex-husband. And he's like, what? <laughs> so he brings the whole gang to the village where her ex-husband lives. Oh. They wreck the village. Fulan walks into her prior home, stabs her ex-husband in the chest, and then drags his body out in front of all the other villagers, leaving him for dead on the side of the road. As a warning to older men to leave young girls alone. Yes. Okay. I'm down with that. <laughs> also during this time, uh, Vikram teaches her how to use a rifle. And she participated in some normal gang activities uh, across Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. Things like robbing higher caste villages, kidnapping upper caste landowners for ransom, train robberies. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> all sorts of fun gang activity. So wait, wait, are they the Robin Hood type of gang or? I think they're kind of regular. Okay, they're just a, a gang. Got it. After every crime, Fulan finds a Durga temple. That's one of uh, Indian uh, goddesses, Hindu mm -hmm. goddesses Durga. And she thanks the goddess for her protection things this was great she's like this is the best like two years in my life of course things can't really go well for our heroine of the story uh so two upper caste gang members named Sri ram and lala ram decide to come back to the gang they were two brothers who belonged to the thakur caste uh the thakur are mostly small landowners so essentially, these two were brothers born into landowner wealth. Mm -hmm. Why you join a gang when you already have money is very confusing to me. They probably wanted to piss off their dad. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Well, when they rejoin the gang, they're like, where's Babu? And uh, everyone's like, he, he died. He did. And they are outraged. But not that Babu was killed, that he was killed by a man of a lower caste. Well, y'all couldn't do anything about it because you weren't here. So why sure. do you care? And they're upset that someone of a lower caste is in charge of the gang and therefore in charge of them. You don't have to come back. You just go. Um, It was just tense. And it was even more tense because Sri Ram kept making sexual advances towards Fulan. And Vikram's like, Ooh. yo, that's my wife. Apologize to her. Yeah. No, no, no. No, 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 no. <sighs> So the thing about this particular gang that Fulan was a part of is that it was comprised of many different people of different castes. And so they would go to like different villages to rob them. And so when the gang robbed a Malin vi village, the Ram brothers would make fun of and mock like the Malin people. That's the same caste that uh, both Vikram and Fulan are a part of. Mm -hmm. And that really upset like members of the gang who were also part of that cast. And they started to leave. Uh, They're like, I can't get any respect in life. And now I'm not even getting respect in my gang. Ooh, yeah. So with that gap in like gang members, Sri Ram gets a dozen the cores to join. And now the gang has more higher cast members than lower cast members. Vikram trying to be a good leader is like, hey, why don't we just split into two groups and y'all can do your upper caste stuff and you can lead them and I will lead the group of like Malin members. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no in in gang fighting and right. we can all be happy. Right, right. Nope. Sri Ram's like, nah. And one night he actually just outright tries to kill both Fulan and Vikram oh. while they're sleeping. Um, Vikram manages to escape that day, uh, but they did kill him several days later. Oh. 
uh, they kidnap uh, Fulan and take her to a, a village. It's called a Bamai village, uh, which is for people of that cast, the core cast. And they lock her up and proceed to beat and gang rape her for several weeks. <sighs> Okay. They would, they also like tried to humiliate her. Like they would make her strip and then walk through the city, like getting water for them or like getting food for them and things. After about three weeks of this, she manages to escape with two of the other Mullen uh, gang members from Vikram's gang and another lower caste villager who helped her out. Okay. Uh, Fulan heads out and begins finding other Malin and creating her own gang with a man by the name of Mon Singh. Uh, he was a member of Vikram's older gang. Mm -hmm. And they begin a series of violent robberies in North and Central India, only targeting the wealthy. They do not target any lower caste villages here. So there are the bad Robin Hoods. Well, so here's the thing. Indian officials will say says say that this is a myth, but many other sources say that Fulan shared her wealth from these attacks with lower caste villages, and that one makes more sense to me. Yeah, because later on, when there is a multi year manhunt for Fulan, nobody can find her. Oh, and I know damn well somebody knew where she was hiding, <laughs> but because she had put them on for so long. They were like, nah, you're good. You're good. We got you. You can hide out in the back room. Nice. She protects us. No yeah. one ever, yep, no one ever turned her in when that manhunt happened. I will explain to you why that manhunt happens in a little bit. Okay. But. <laughs> so this goes on for 17 months of her attacking these very wealthy tribe, these very wealthy like villages, mm -hmm. uh, stealing the stuff. Like. <laughs> Uh, doing her Robin Hood thing. And uh, after about 17 months, she has this whole gang of lower caste people around her and they decide they're going to return to Bamai. She is looking for the Rom brothers. On February 14th, 1981, Fulan and her gang show up dressed like police officers. The Thakurs in the village are actually preparing for a wedding. And if you know anything about Indian weddings, they are massive community events that are very lavish and very beautiful. So the entire community is a part of this. They're all out getting ready for this wedding. They basically shut down the whole town for that, right? Oh, Fulan does not care. Oh, okay. She wanted two things. She requested all of the money and valuables in the city. And she said, bring me Sri Ram and uh, Lala Ram. Oh, now, details of what happened next are a little bit fuzzy. Some say that because she couldn't find the Ram brothers, she became enraged. Others say that while she was looking through the city, she recognized several of the Thakur who had participated in her rapes and had murdered her husband. Mm. What we do know is that what ensues on February 14th is the largest massacre by an outlaw in all of Indian history. The gang searches the entire town at gunpoint, and when they cannot find the Ram, the Ram brothers, they line up every Thakur man in the village and shoot him. Many of whom had nothing to do with her prior assault. Of course. At the end of the day, though, 22 men are dead. Ugh. Later, Fulan would say she actually never raised her weapon that day because she was saving her bullets for the Ram brothers. Makes sense. And the killings were actually done by her gang. Uh, essentially as a, a means to kind of uphold her honor. Regardless, the police launch a massive manhunt after the St. Valentine Massacre. Ah. They do refer to it as ah. the St. Valentine Massacre, only the Indian St. Valentine Massacre. Okay. Uh, also, it's also known as the Bamai Massacre. And remember how I said magically none of the lower caste villagers never knew anything about Fulan's whereabouts? Right, of course. That's why I think she must have made all of those people believe in her based on the fact that she supported them financially because no cops ever found her. In fact, the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh 
uh, his name was VP Singh, actually resigned in the wake of the Bamai massacre. And this is the point in history when the people of India begin to call Fulan Devi the bandit queen. I love it so much. They start making dolls that look like her. Oh my God, I want one. <laughs> and the dolls are dressed as a Hindu goddess Durga and they're being sold all over Uttar Pradesh. Oh my God. And the Indian media is pretty much like, yeah, this chick is awesome. Like if you honestly, if you go look up pictures of her right now, yeah. there are really cool photos of her in this like, she's got like the, the whole bullet belt across her chest Ooh. carrying a rifle. She looks like a freedom fighter. <laughs> I love it so much. This media frenzy captures the attention of the prime minister who requests the help of as many police as he can to find her. We're talking thousands of police have come to uh, Uttar Pradesh to find her. They request the help of several different rival gangs who want to kill her hmm. to try and find her. And the reason why there was this political push here is because Fulan had upset the social order of India. She was from one of the lowest castes, and she had threatened higher caste people, humiliated them, and even if she was just a small town girl with a really tiny gang beside her, given she was giving the lower caste people hope that she that they could rise up, and she was a threat to the upper caste. How dare she? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting because when you look at other other materials, upper caste people write about her. As if she is this ruthless villain who murdered a man on his wedding day. But for millions of the untouchables in India, Fulan is this badass, gunslinging, bandana wearing outlaw who was a goddess among humans. Hmm. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> so by 1983, this manhunt's been going on for two years. Mm. The police cannot find her. The rival gangs cannot find her. The bandit queen is elusive. But for Fulan, she is exhausted. I imagine. I'm not running around. She's 30 years old, but she feels much older than her time. Many of the people who have been riding with her throughout this process now, roughly almost four years, there are a lot of them are dead. Or they're just exhausted. Um, so she reaches out to a Gandhian peace activist who, reach, who reached out on her behalf to the government. And they negotiate a surrender. She agrees. She'll surrender February 1983. But I have some conditions. <laughs> of course. First, she says, I don't trust any police or or politician in Uttar Pradesh. So I'm going to surrender myself to the Madhya Pradesh pr police, which is nearby state. Mm -hmm. Then she says, I will only lay down my guns in front of a picture of Mahatma Gandhi and goddess Durga, not the police. There you go. Then she tells them, you can have my surrender if death penalty is off the table. None of my gang members will be jailed for longer than eight years. I want the plot of land that my uncle stole returned to my family. She's still on that. Oh, my God. It's been 15 years. It's been what? How many years? You said she's 30, right? No, I think. Wait. So, wait. It's 1983 and she was born in. Oh, God. 1963. No, she's actually. So, it's 20. She's 20 years she's old. She's 20. This has been like I mean, okay. 10 years. Okay. I mean, that grudge. <laughs> Ten years. It's been ten years. Oh my I had God. the wrong number in my notes. I'm sorry, y'all. It's been she's twenty years old. It's been ten years. And she's like, I want the plot of land that my uncle stole from my family returned. Right now. And you can have me. Go right ahead. And then she says, My brother needs a job, so get him a job in the government. He needs to provide for his family. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Oh my god. This is my she's like Yeah, this is one of the best stories I've ever read. Like she could be like one of my heroes. Oh my god. 
like India made a movie about her and she actually hated it and she like threatened like to like harm herself in public if they didn't remove it. Oh damn. They ended up giving her a settlement over it, but like I feel like we should do a modern movie about her. Mm definitely oh my god not like a bollywood like there no, shouldn't be any dancing no. and singing in this film no give me this a... needs to be like a real hardcore tale oh this... yeah oh my god i'd love to see that absolutely like what a cre- oh, just listen but either way considering the government hasn't caught her they're like fine whatever we'll give you what you asked for so finally after 10 years and many bodies and her humiliating wealthy people and <laughs> I just love it. Stealing from the, the rich and giving to the poor. She manages to get the whole 15 anchors her father desires. Thank you. Returned to him. Good job. Good job. So uh the the Gandhian uh, peace activist uh lets a police chief know where she is. Uh he arrives at uh their hiding place, which is in the Chambal ravines. Um, he meets her and the gang mates and they walk to the city of Bind. There is a crowd of roughly 10,000 people and 300 unarmed police officers. And the chief minister of Madhya Pradesh, his name is Arjun Singh. And they all watch her as she puts down her guns in front of two gigantic portraits of Gandhi and the goddess Durga. And then they all surrender themselves. I fucking love this so much. <laughs> and this is where a real big circus starts. Oh, no. Come on. So Long gets charged with a total of 48 crimes. Uh, 30 of them are de- decoity, which is just straight banditry. Mm. Things she did while she was lead the gang. You said 30 of them? 30 charges. Okay. Um, she also gets charged with kidnapping. And the wheels of justice seem to be working, but they grind to a halt. Now that Fulan is in prison, the former Thakur gang members and all of her other enemies begin filing cases against her, requesting trial after trial that keep her original case from being ever handled. Um, it was it was like they found a weird loophole where they could keep her in the system as long as another rich the core popped up and charged her with something ridiculous. I hate them now. And the problem is, even though her family had gotten their land back, they didn't really have money for proper legal representation. And the prime minister, actually, um, Indira Gandhi, had been assassinated shortly after her capture. So the whole government was going through a, a new process of new people being in power and things of that nature. And this continues. Now, mind you, she was she surrendered herself in 1983. Mm-hmm. This goes on for 11 years. With her being in a, a legal I don't know what would you call it, uh, purgatory almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in 1994, a new prime minister gets elected, who is also of a lower caste, and he just goes, "This is absolutely ridiculous that y'all are still doing this," and he actually just outright pardons her. Yes, he says, "He says screw it." Yes, she did nothing wrong. Fantastic. Release Fulan. I love this. <laughs> like, this, wait, this is a murder story. It is because I love Remember, this so much. She did kill like. 27 so 22 people yeah but these are men right yes okay <laughs> i mean i mean what <laughs> i love this so much okay um so it's it's 1994 and she's free but jail has been very hard um i mean now she's 31 uh and but she finds that as she's been released back into Indian society, she's still very much a beloved figure among the masses. It's almost a little bit of a like the reason why like when she said she called herself an international legend, there there was a lot of legend and and awe about her at this point. Mm. And she thinks about it for those next two years and then she decides, well, what I'm gonna do with all of this social capital I've somehow earned over the last 10 years is I'm going to run for parliament. Um, and she runs on the platform of speaking for the untouchables and for women. There you go. Yes. Because women have very little political representation. Actually, and she wins in that 1996 election. 
And after she was elected, she gets interviewed by a Western journalist who talks to her about, like, you know, the fact that she was sexually assaulted. And Mm -hmm. this is what she said. It's a direct quote. You can call it rape in your fancy language. Do you have any idea what it's like to live in a village in India? What you call rape, that kind of thing happens to poor women in the villages every day. It is assumed that the daughters of the poor are for the use of the rich. They assume that we're their property. In the villages, the poor have no toilets, so we must go to the fields. And the moment we arrive, the rich lay us there. We can't get the grass or tend to our crops without being accosted by them. We are the property of the rich. They wouldn't let us live in peace. You will never understand what kind of humiliation that is. If they wanted to rape us, molest us, and our families objected, then they'd rape us in front of our families. Um, that was the the life that she was born into. Yeah. And unfortunately, in certain rural areas of India, even today, that is stuff that happens. Obviously, not all of it. A huge section of India is very uh, tech savvy. I mean, mm-hmm. they people have very advanced degrees, huge science. But it's a, it's a country where you have huge cities with technological leaps and advancements. And then you have rural cities that are very, very small, way, 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 way out in the middle of nowhere. Right. Right. Where there's very little uh, protection. Like there isn't even a police department in some of these small villages. Oh. So it becomes the will of the people. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember, I believe I remember a couple of years ago reading a story about a woman who was sexually assaulted and she beheaded the man who raped her and she walked into the town, like the center of town holding his head and being like, here you go. This is my honor. And she like threw his head in the middle of town. She did get apprehended, but I still applaud her. Right. Absolutely. I mean, Hey, she got arrested for murder, but I'm like, eh, I mean, really? She defended herself. Exactly. Should have stayed out of my hut. Is that a pun? No, I'm just saying you should have stayed out of my hut. Okay. <laughs> I was about to say, I'm the pun maker around here. I was going to say, I don't make puns. That's you. <laughs> but, uh, she- like, Fulan had a very solid social justice philosophy, actually. She believed in Gandhi, Buddha, Jesus, Durga, and a man by the name of Bameo Am- Ambedkar. Ambedkar. He was an Indian politician who campaigned for social reform, and he also campaigned against discrimination of the untouchables as well. Um, she lost her seat in Parliament in 98 and then got it right back a year later. Nice. She actually, she lived in a modest home and she did get married again. Strangely enough, she did meet somebody whose ideals lined up with hers and supported her in her political career. Okay. Now, I hate the way you're speaking because it sounds like you're talking in the past tense. <sighs> like she's not around anymore. Because she isn't. And we're getting into that point now. Uh-huh. Um, Fulan was never unaware that she had many many enemies um she had a dog at home she had guards who accompanied her whenever she left her house she wore a bulletproof vest anytime she left home and she carried an end an enfield rifle and a bandolier full of ammo on her at all times um but unfortunately you can't hide forever and she not only had the core enemies still from the Bamai massacre, mm. but she had gained new enemies as a politician because of her political views that lower caste Indian citizens deserved rights too. On July 26, 2001, at the age of 37, three masked gunmen attacked Falan outside of her bungalow in Delhi, uh, India. Mm-hmm. She was hit nine times in the head, chest, shoulders, and right arm. Her personal security guard did his best returning fire, taking several shots to the chest and arm as well. Um, He did a good job, though, because the gunman actually abandoned their car, so he must have shot something on it to make it stop. Right, right. Uh, And they got on an auto rickshaw and kept going. Uh, They they had a plan. They had a, like, they had a plan A and they had a plan B for if the car got destroyed in the process. Mm -hmm. Um. 
The police later recovered a Webley and Scott pistol, several improvised, like homemade firearms in their car, several revolvers, nine empty rounds, and 15 live rounds, which proved that the shots came from the car. Okay. They were hiding within the car to shoot her. Um, she was rushed to uh, the Ram Manahar Lahaya Hospital, but she was pronounced dead on arrival. And the prime suspect was a man by the name of Shur Singh Rana. And he did eventually surrender himself to the police. Uh, he claimed that this was revenge for the Bamai massacre and was sentenced to life in prison August of 2014. Mm. Which also lets you another, because remember, this happened in 2001. Yeah. It took 13 years to get him to trial. Oh, my God. Um, it was a violent death for a woman whose life was full of violence. Yeah. It it almost seems kind of balanced, but still very wrong. Now I'm sad. Yeah. She just, she lived in a really ruthless time that called for lawlessness. Yeah. Um, she single-handedly gave the middle finger to one of the oldest stratification systems in existence by herself, suffering repeatedly in the process. I, it's it's kind of interesting. Like I, when, as I was writing this, I was just thinking about that line from Pulp Fiction that Sam Jackson says, "You know, I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who would attempt to poison and destroy my brothers." Like Fulon de V was that righteous anger and and sometimes vengeance she really was oh my god you know and i think she just improved she just proved that sometimes that is the only way to get things done oh my god yes. <laughs> i can't pretend to even uh, I, I can't even like fathom growing up in a place where a stray dog had more rights than a woman but mm. Damn it if she didn't give it her best shot. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of this <laughs> uh, was researched, or this was based off of The Bandit Queen of India, an Indian woman's amazing journey from peasant to international legend by Fulan Devi, Marie Therese Cuny, and Paul Rambali. And interestingly point. enough, she didn't ever learn how to read. Which is why she needed people to help her write her autobiography. Right. But still, impressive. That's it's a big, awesome. it's a beautiful, lengthy book. Oh my god, I need this book for my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, this is an easy thing to pick up from the library, but I'm gonna get me a copy myself mm -hmm. to have. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Like I said, because she didn't agree with the movie about her life that came out in the '90s, mm. I don't think I'll be watching that one. Right. Yeah. But. This is just listen. Anybody from Hollywood, if you are listening, this is the story. I know we have a lot of California listeners. So this is the story. If you are looking to get your first script accepted, this is the one. <laughs> Do it. Get and it bonus, the whole cast would have to be from India. So we get inclusivity. Let's please. Oh, my God. There's got to be an Indian director who wants to make this their first major film. I just, can I just say how much I love, I, I mean, I said it a few times already when you're telling the story, but I fucking love this story. Yeah. Like, it ended, like, I wish she was still alive. We'd be like, hey, let's go visit India. <laughs> but no. Oh, my God. I Oh, oh, Brittany, you gave me a gift today. <laughs> I, like I said, as soon as, like, as soon, once I saw that title of the book, I was like, oh, uh, like, remember when I texted you mm -hmm. and I was just like, I found my person for this week. <laughs> I know who I'm talking about. Yes. And like, the thing is, I only read like the cursory little bubble on the book. Like when I read, the, I was like, I was like, oh, this is great. This, I, there was nothing where I was like, oh, this is wonderful. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I was like, I, I feel better for knowing about Fulan Devi. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Now I do want to say, now that I, I like, I did love that story immensely oh my fucking god i love that story so much um i'm not going to backtrack anything i said by the way i just want to say that um to any of the men that are listening <laughs> i'm like i'm not sorry but if you assault a woman 
and you expect no consequences to happen to you or like you expect n- like no repercussions from your actions and you-, you know what the only downside is that i couldn't find out what happened to the rom brothers yeah I where mean, did y'all go I hope they because died. fulan was looking for you <laughs> she was ready she had a bullet with your name on it. She, she had two bullets, by the way. Two bullets with your, your names on it. I was looking. I was like, where did where'd these two guys go? They just disappeared into the <laughs> but, history books. But yeah, like I, like, I advocate for... What would you say? What, what, would, you, what would you call this? Like, th- like treating... Like, treat women like they're people. Please. Oh, yeah. Not like they're less than you. Like, if you're a man, you're a male whatever um well, what's the interesting thing is that we look at a place like india or like rural india where some yeah. of these things happen or even you know 30 years ago what happened to uh fulan de v like and we of course i'm sure there will people who listen to us and they will go oh well it's what well, we live we're so much better than that no the fuck you're not nope, no the fuck we're nope, not we're not we're not we're we're count to like 10 two women have been sexually assaulted in america oh my god women or children <sighs> That's how rampant it is. It's just not. It, we don't. We, nobody like. I, I guess it's like it's it's a thing that's hidden. Yeah, it, a lot of it is. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it's a thing that's shameful for the person that it happens to. We're still not in a place where people can be honest about their sexual assaults. Exactly, and it's like if you bring it up in the court, oh yeah, you don't remember all this stuff. You're obviously lying. No, it's it's because I was drugged. Okay. Or there's other situations, like uh, there's been situations that I've been involved in where it was it could have been that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and no one wants to discuss that there's trauma related to. Well, I'll just be honest because that's kind of where we are and this is the environment that we've created. Uh, I had a friend who I knew from college and I had an apartment in Philadelphia. This was years later and he was a lawyer and he would get drunk sometimes and I had an extra bedroom in my apartment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes my other roommate would be there. Uh, One of the girls had moved out and so I had a guy roommate and it was just me. And sometimes he wouldn't be there. But either way, I would let him use the extra room multiple times this happened loads of times and then one night you know brought him in he's drunk let him sleep on that leftover mattress that had been there from our old roommate Mm -hmm. and i looked up and he was standing in my doorway and he was butt naked oh no and he kept trying to climb into my bed with me and when i was like whoa he was just like no come on come on and like i have a very vivid memory of me kicking him in the junk in the middle of the dark. And then I also remember saying to him, one of us is going to die tonight if you keep going this route. Mm-hmm. And he stopped and he thought about it <sighs> and he left. He slammed my door in which I immediately locked it. He went back to the other room, I guess, and got dressed. And then he went downstairs and he, because it was like a like a walkway down to get to the door to the apartment. Right, and he right, slammed okay. that door too. And then I ran downstairs and I like locked that door and I put the slide lock on it. And I texted some of our mutual friends and I was like, he crossed the line. We're not friends anymore. Don't talk to me about him. In a weird sort of kind of hilarious situation that happened. Um, I got invited to a party that he was going to be at. And it was, you know, mutual friends. And I just said, is so-and-so going to be there? And uh, my friend was like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I won't be coming. And she's like, what happened between you two? And I was just like, he, he crossed the line. He violated a barrier for me and I just don't want to be around him ever again. Right. Now, a lot of people will say, Hey, you know, why didn't you, that was an attempted assault. And I'm like, cause what's anybody going to do? Nothing bad. Nothing actually happened. That's another barrier we have in the States. No one was going to take that seriously. It was just, you know, yeah. a drunk guy trying to climb in my bed, but here's where his intention was real because he went to that party and my friend, being the nosy person that she is, was just like, what happened between you and Brittany? And he was just like, oh, what did she say? That I like tried to rape her or something? Mm. And everyone at the party was like, no, but did you? Obviously, you fucking did. You. So <laughs> he very much outed himself to uh, my friend group in that regard. And then everybody stopped talking to him too but that let me know that that was the intention because in my head you know you think about that as somebody who's through a situation like well maybe he didn't you know mean that maybe he was just drunk or whatever nah he knew what he was doing yeah 
the whole time. Okay, Maybe that's... even before then. Maybe that there was a slow plan to slowly work his way up to to what he did. You know what I mean? And so that's. But everybody I know has a story like this. So oh, we can't insane. look at any other culture and point fingers and say they are worse than us. Everybody I know has a story like this. Yeah, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that India is worse or anywhere. No, else I'm just is saying worse. to the I'm people saying... listening, please don't. Oh yeah, uh... no. I'm saying every man in the world, or any every like every woman in the world has a story like this. Yeah, so many people of of all genders, of all ages, uh, working in education. We do a fair amount of training on child sexual assault, and it is very rampant when in, within American society. I, I believe the current number is 25% of all children before the ages of 18 will be assaulted, and that's the lowest it's been in like 50 years. It used to be worse. It gives me no hope. I hate that. Number. Almost no hope for the. Oh god. You know. So uh, <laughs> this is this is the world that we live in, and we have to make. Yeah, and, and the best choices, and do the best for ourselves that we can. But and please, this is why I can't feel bad for anybody who's been a victim of any of these sort of things. If you've watched the TikTok and you've heard me say that. I empathize with Eileen Wernos. That's why. Absolutely. Because <clears throat> I and so many of the people who I know and care about have been in positions like that. I cannot, like, I understand that not all of the people she killed were uh, rapists, but the first one was. Mm -hmm. And the other ones were people who were treating her like that one. So, uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it wasn't a short line for them to cross if, you know, if she let them cross that line. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, I, uh, I will always, Fulon DeV, Eileen Wernos, other women who avenge Mwah. their assaults, you got my support. Absolutely. Mine too. I, that's why I love this story. Oh, and it's still. Women's History Month. It is. And I'm so glad you did a story for Women's History. That's why it's a gift as well. I, <laughs> I fucking loved it. I'm not even gonna lie. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. All right. <clears throat> so now I guess we're getting into my part of mm -hmm. this this segment. Uh okay. Well, this week and next week, and hopefully not any longer than that. I'm going to try to keep it down to this, these two episodes. Okay. Because there's a lot I want to talk about, but then I'm like, I don't know how much I want to like stress this out to. So, mm, I'll be talking about something that no one asked for. But guess what? You're going to get it. <laughs> what did no one ask for? All right. Talking about the paranormal investigators, the beautiful couple. And Lorraine Warren. Ah! <laughs> I love Lorraine Warren. Yes. So much. Oh, it was so sad when she finally passed. She yes. passed last year. I know. Um. Listen, I'm not. Listen, it's just. It's all about. It's always been about Lorraine for me. By the time I even learned who she was, her husband was already gone. But um. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, unfortunately. Like, I started watching ghost shows, mm -hmm. and I saw her uh, helping some of the different shows. Like, yes, yes. Uh, using her abilities there, so. And then I was like, wait a second. That sounds familiar. And then I realized that I had read the Amityville Horror books, and mm -hmm. so I already knew them. I just didn't make the connection until I was a little older. Okay, okay. Well, I wanted to just talk about Lorraine, of course. Oh, but wonderful. You can't talk about one. This is great without because without talking about the other. I gave you a gift <laughs> and now you are giving me a gift. Yes. Of my favorite paranormal couple. There we go. So yeah. So you can't talk about one without talking about the other. So I'll be talking about them both in this two two part episode. Two part episode. Possibly two parts. Hopefully not anymore. I'm trying to keep it down to two parts. 
So I'm still going to try to focus on Lorraine for the most part of this stuff. So for these two parts, I'm going to start out by, for this first part, with their background, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where they started. And then I do a little bit of a touch on, I guess, their research on ghosts. Mm -hmm. um, and for the next episode, I will be covering all, not all of their cases, but most of their cases, um, including some other famous ones that they've done. Um, Annabelle in Amityville or, you know, Amityville as well but the real annabelle not the no, 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 story no. in the movie no 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 not that one no we're not doing conjuring we're the not conjuring, doing conjuring is a real story okay but yeah the annabelle doll is yeah. different from how they portray well yeah. correction they portrayed annabelle correctly in the the conjuring story it's the subsequent sequels that have nothing okay, to do so with the, the original the spin-off sequel that yeah. they got okay so i'm not talking about oh, that so they one. don't talk about the fact that uh it's not the doll in the movie because they couldn't get the rights to put the real doll yeah, I know. in the actual movie. Really? Raggedy Ann? It, no, Raggedy Ann would not agree. That Was it Mattel or one of those companies would not agree to put the dolls in the film? So they had to come up with that ugly You're going to tarnish our name. Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, uh, you got a haunted doll, guys. I mean, you can't really fight that. But anyway. <laughs> but I'm so here for this. Yes, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. No problem. Um, But yeah, for the second part, I'm going to do all their... The juicy ghost event investigations. Um, so I can't start this out with, with without mentioning one one big source for this story. The book I was waiting like I guess like a week for to come. Right, it was like super delayed. Yes, it was. It's um the demonologist. Ah, uh, yeah. Because it is the only uh non priest uh demonologist in existence there right there you go yeah he was given permission by the vatican to continue doing uh exorcisms, exorcisms yeah even though he was not part of the well he's part of the faith but he was not an official clergyman absolutely yes so this is the demonologist extraordinary career of ed lorraine warren oh i love it and an article i did like uh, i touched on this article done by the the ap um the associated press it's just I touched on it like lightly, but that that's about it. So I feel yeah, I like to have con con contrasting opinions. Yeah, I have I have another source. I just don't know where it's from. It's um it's basically like a research paper someone else did. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, you uh, didn't go to their uh, bibliography. I do that sometimes. The the person that wrote this. I, when people write little things, I look up their bibliography and then I go to their book. Oh no 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 no! It's like a an actual like. Okay, so the, the, oh, like a thesis. Yeah, so the 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 name of this, uh, I guess it's a whatever you want to call it. It's a internet thing. It's called Fifty Years of Ghost Hunting and Research with the Warrens. So I'm pretty sure you could look that up on Google, and it'll take you right to this page. Um, so the interview is done by Jeff Belanger. Mm -hmm. Belanger. Blanger. That sounds familiar too. Okay, so there you go. All right, so let's start this little ride I got for you guys. So Lorraine Warren, born Lorraine Rita Warren. Um, she was born in Jan she was born on January thirty first, in nineteen twenty seven. Ed Warren was born on September seventh, nineteen twenty six. They're both born in Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut. So, Lorraine, born with the power of clairvoyance, she discovered at an early age that she was different from other children. At the age of 12, she found out how different she was. So, on one Arbor Day, at an all, she, was, she was at an all-girls uh, private school. Oh, okay. Um, you know, they were planting a sapling. And Lorraine, she's she's like look, they're planting a sapling. All the other girls are like looking, <clears throat> and you know as a, as a sapling being planted. And Lorraine, she's actually looking up, and in the tree. She, yes, she's uh. looking up into the sky, and um, one of the I guess the nuns 
noticed her looking up and I'm like, Blaine, what are you looking at? And she was like, I'm looking at this tree right here. And there was no tree there. It was just a sapling. So she was... Oh, wait. She's looking at the ghost of a tree? She's looking at the future of the tree. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, see, I always thought of her as a medium. Oh, she has a whole different set of skills I never realized. She's clairvoyant. So... I mean, oh. you, I guess you call it like it's. I guess it's two separate things. Yeah. I guess I should explain. Well, because I guess because way. on the ghost shows they want her to look into the past. Yeah. But she can see. But yeah, clair- clairvoyance is the future. Yeah. So she has the ability to see both. Mm-hmm. Oh goodness. Yeah. I didn't realize. Yeah. So. um... <laughs> yeah, I wrote this little joke, but never mind. But yeah, the number's like, "What you looking at, kid?" And Lorraine's like, "Tree, duh." And <laughs> the line goes like, "Uh, Lorraine, use future sight, like a Pokemon." Oh my gosh! <laughs> and Lorraine goes, "Super effective." <laughs> oh my gosh. And then the goes, "Okay, time." <laughs> Okay, tiny witch, time for you to go pray. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So um, wait, did they really assume that something was wrong with her though? Yeah. Um. No, I would have assumed like if a, if one of your kids told me that, I would be like, oh, one of my kids. This is just pretend time. One of my kids. Yes. No, if Cassandra tells you something like this, believe her. Yeah, but Cassandra sees beings, not a future tree. Okay, if she tells you something like this, believe her. Jaden, I'm not too sure about him. He doesn't have the gift. Listen, oh. it, it's not necessarily a gift. Little kids are more open. Yeah. That door might close as she gets older. So, <laughs> this true. At least hopefully for you or else you're going to have to deal with this. I mean, hopefully she doesn't. It doesn't close for her. But um, So, they sent her to a retreat to pray. Oh. The Pokemon... Away, <laughs> poor Lorraine. So yes, they tra- they they sent her for away for the weekend to to pray. It was only a weekend. This least yeah. it wasn't like one of those scary places. No, 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 no. It was it was a retreat. Just get a uh. so wait. So they sent her out into the woods. It was a retreat. So. You know so where it was, at, it was at like a I guess like a Bible retreat. I'm guessing. Yeah, those are usually out in the wilderness. Okay, and you know locations oh, where yeah. bad things have happened out in the wilderness okay okay yes. so she can see more things <laughs> so after she told you know the nun this and she got sent to retreat she was like okay i'm just gonna keep this stuff to myself now smart smart girl just so you know i don't get in trouble anymore mm-hmm. so lorraine was even tested at the ucla to judge her clairvoyance and it was uh judged uh beyond average so, so have you ever seen Ghostbusters? Yes. The original, like the first one. Yes. Okay. Do you remember, like in like the first scene, um, Venkman's he, he's he's testing these two students for mm-hmm. like clairvoyance. Yes. Like okay, and he's but like, isn't he using like a machine? He's using like a sh- okay. So what he does, he he's holding up a card to himself and he's asking them what 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 do you see behind this card right and so i've actually seen that done multiple times on the internet oh really i just thought they were making fun of they were like doing the movie thing i mean probably (laughs) but if that's actually like the way they test clairvoyance that's interesting so and and then like he would give like a a shock to if you got it wrong Mm -hmm. and the guy so it was a guy and a girl and the guy, he like freaks out. He's like, "What are you even doing here?" And he's like, "Whoa, sir! I'm testing to see if negative, like negative reinforcement, affects clairvoyance." And yeah, I was just thinking about that because my in my head, I'm like, the fear of the shot could affect a lot of people to ruin their ability to answer the questions yes. correctly. Yes. Um, and well, that explain that's perfectly because it's Venkman, but yeah, <laughs> no, he's my he's he's my, I mean Bill Murray. Come on now, I mean, um. But it's funny that he says this, and the guy got the card right after being shocked so many times. He just got pissed off, and he's like, I don't know, like a figure eight or something. And he's like, and Bakeman's like, no, you got it wrong. And it was a freaking figure eight on the card, though. 
And he just wanted to mess with the guy because he's. He, and I was just like, this reminds me of something. They would probably do something like this. But I think the the test actually it doesn't involve being shocked like Ghostbusters, but it does involve you trying to discern. Yeah, yeah. Things in another room or situations. Like I'm pretty that. sure that's yeah, that's how you do it. So um, they did that to her at UCLA. Um, not I didn't go really into it, but I know they tested her for that. Yeah. Oh, cool. So anyway, Ellen and Rain met at the age of sixteen, while Ed was an usher at a theater in Bridgeport. Um, he had seen the rain. I know the story. Oh, do you know the story? Keep going. It's cute. <laughs> it's cute in only like the way that things in the 40s and 50s were cute. If they did this now, this is not cute. This is true. But this was cute back then. He, so he had seen her and her mom coming to the, you know, coming to the theater every Wednesday night. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Ed started talking to her and they became friends. Mm-hmm. And one night when he walks her home, he he basically just asked her out. And I guess you could say it's history from there. Yeah, it would be unheard of now that, like, the guy you randomly buy popcorn from, you allow to walk you home (laughs) from the movies. Like, that would never happen now, but isn't it adorable? I mean, you can be friends with them. You can talk to them nicely and stuff like that. You talk to people nicely, but I have what I refer to as real relationships and people who are doing things for you relationships so like if i take an uber i talk to the uber driver and i'm super nice to them uh-huh. but as soon as i get out of the car that relationship is over <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you just remind me of that freaking doordash thing oh yeah that doordash left you. yeah ah, ah. no that no that the... they left the food on the front of the uh dry in front of the the garage? No, garage. No, no, I'm talking about something else. But oh, you mean that guy who like called the lady up the next day and yeah. was like, "Hey, you've been in my mind." Yeah, exactly. Like, oh my god, no, dude. This Move. is just like the man hater episode. I'm. <laughs> I'm not sorry. So anyway, let's go back to talking about our lovely couple. All oh, right, all right. So Ed, his childhood was different. So he grew up in a haunted house oh. uh, from the ages of five to twelve same house um like he started seeing ghosts at the age of five. Oh no yep. that's that's when it happens yep so he had a landlady that died um and a year later late at night he was in i guess his room you know everything's dark and stuff mm-hmm. his closet his closet door starts opening up and it's always the closet why y'all can't leave these children alone like like i told you did i tell you about that yes okay. it's always the closet it's yeah. the closet in <laughs> your house too yes no for me i mean my story with the closet well you have a closet story too yeah. <laughs> i was talking about cassandra saying that there was somebody in her mother's closet no 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 i'm talking about like at um our old old house old old old, old, old house um where my grandma died in and it was a room she died in. And, you know, was, we would share that room. And, like, some nights, the closet door, you you would hear it just creaking open nice and slowly and opening. <laughs> I just have to imagine that there's just ghosts who are trying to, like, figure out their powers. And mm-hmm. they're just like, oh, I'm going to get this door open. And they're just trying so hard. And it goes, creak. And they're like, yes, I'm finally <laughs> getting my ghost powers. Because, like, why are they all messing with the doors? I just think my grandma was just messing with us. Leave us alone. <laughs> We're she, trying to sleep. She liked to pick us, pick on all of us. So ah, that I'm pretty sure that's what she was doing. But um, so his closet door opens. And at first he sees a ghost orb light thing. Right. Um, yeah. And it starts to slowly, like a human form oh it starts turning into something and it becomes this landlady who had died a year before did she say something um so no she didn't say anything but tell your mom to fix the pipes (laughs) (laughs) but while she was alive she wasn't she didn't really like kids oh dang it so but she didn't do anything to him she just had like the aggressively child free strike again. Her her resting B face on the whole time that he saw her. Mm-hmm. And when she was a ghost, she had the same face on. Aww. And so 
The Itani body? Yeah. Yeah. So he sees her and she looks grumpy, you know, like she always does. And then she disappears. Mm-hmm. Now he goes and tells his dad this. And his dad told him, never tell anybody about it again. Oh. So his dad, like, his dad was uh, very devout. Um, so, you know, it kind of makes sense. So is that how he got more into the church then? Yeah. I mean, yeah, they grew mm. up, he grew up church, church boy. Uh-oh. Um, either way, Adam and Lorraine, they got married at the age of six, uh, 18, God, 18 years old. Well, he was in the Navy. Yeah, I thought so. I thought I saw their picture. Yep. 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 Um, they also had a daughter. I think it was, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, they have a daughter. Well, yeah, yeah, they have, have a daughter, have, and I believe her husband is the one who runs the museum now. There you go. I think the daughter doesn't have anything to do with it, but her mm-hmm. husband does. Because when that whole Annabelle's escaped meme happened on oh the internet God. last year, he was the one who like had to like make a YouTube video and be like, "She's still here. Yeah, huh? She didn't go anywhere, y'all. I don't know where this came from, but Annabelle's where she always is." Oh my God. Sorry. So after World War II was over, um, they were actually going to be artists. Oh. Yeah. Did you know that? I did not know that was their original location. Yeah. Um, They did this for five years, actually. Um, Now I want to look up and see if they did anything good. So they painted. What did they paint? Churchy stuff. Ghosty stuff? Close. Demons? Well, no. They painted haunted houses. Oh! So ghosty stuff. Yeah, they would paint haunted houses. They thought, you know, it'll be relatable. Um, I don't know. How, Are but... any of their haunted house paintings haunted? I don't think so. I'm I just, just think they painted the houses or just sketched houses. Um, so this is how we'll go. Ed would, you know, research houses from the newspaper. Um, he would drag Lorraine along, and they would he would sketch out the houses from the outside. And then he ended up talking to the people, didn't he? Oh, you jumping ahead? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just it's a natural like you have to right. Yeah, you have to confirm that the okay. house is haunted. So what 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 he would do is the people, the owners of the house, they would be looking out the windows like. What are y'all doing? What are these teenagers doing outside of our house? Are, are you, you casing us? Joint? Saying, are you casing? <laughs> are you casing our house right now? And so you know, either Ed or Lorraine or both of them, where they would go up to the door, knock on the door, show them the sketch, mm-hmm. and you know, tell them what they were doing, and then they would ask for more information about the haunting. Okay, as I was wondering where we're, I was like, they have to confirm the haunting, don't they? Yeah. So they would, you know, exchange the sketch that they drew for, you know, information about, you know, the haunting in the house. And if the haunting was particularly interesting, Mm -hmm. they would definitely, they would definitely paint the house and then, you know, investigate it a little bit. Write down the story, probably. Yeah, exactly. So they could add it to their collection. Oh. So in the beginning, Rain was basically a skeptic, like. She had no experience with ghosts or hauntings. Oh, so at this point, she's only experiencing clairvoyance. Yes. Not medium. No, power. not not ghostly stuff. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I assumed that the way that she was by the time, you know, I saw her on TV or, you know, read her stuff, mm-hmm. that that's how she'd always been. I mean, this is a teenager now, so, I mean. I, I imagine, her. like everything else in life, your abilities develop and, and deepen. As you age, yeah. Now they did get her, her clairvoyance did get stronger as mm-hmm. they were researching houses and you know going more in depth with the ghost stuff mm-hmm. and the spirit stuff, um, or you know, hauntings. But damage. so she is like, listen, I can see the future. I don't know about this ghost thing. I enjoy drawing. Yeah. So when does it become real for her? I'm getting to that. Now Ed, on the other hand, he was down a clown, so to say. Like he was, he, he, he's seen a ghost before. So he's like, let's get more into this creepy stuff. It's like you and me. If like, if you're clairvoyant and I've seen like a ghost, 
Listen, once in my we'd life. Be contacting sci- uh, uh, the Travel Channel <laughs> or something. Oh my but the God. problem is, I'm far too um, scared. Yeah. To be in that environment for very long, I would be the one on the ghost show who, like, something would like creak, and I'd be like, oh, "Did you see that?" Oh my god! <laughs> like, that's me because I'm terrified. Never mind. You I'll... would be like charging into the darkness to I'm find not the thing. Zach, I am not. No, Zach. you're not Zach Bagans because I am Aaron. Oh Whoa! My god. <laughs> <laughs> I am not trying to fight the ghost. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> well, that's the old Zach. Now yeah. Zach. Yes, in the beginning, he was trying to fight the ghost. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But no, I'd probably be more the more sensitive. Plus, You'd be, you'd be from the original Ghost Hunters, you'd be yeah. Nick. Yeah. You want to know the answers. Absolutely. Definitely. I Deep mean- in my heart, I want to be Katrina from... <laughs> listen, the, anybody who listens to ghost stuff, you know what I'm talking about. You know Katrina. I want to be like Katrina. She's very, like, brave... I'm not, though. I'm scared. <laughs> I believe in this stuff, and I'm scared. Oh, my God. <laughs> you got this. You, you'll be good. All right. So even before um, Ellen and Lorraine were married, he had devoured so much research into the, superma- in the supernatural mm-hmm. and, you know, from his past experience, of course. So he was just, he was like, okay, I, I kind of got, like, base you know knowledge of this so i'm I'm down to like give you some answers oh. if the people at the houses wanted to oh so they're like listen you're right this place is haunted and he's like uh let me help you with that exactly have you heard of sage <laughs> do you know what a salt ring is oh my god can we not the salt <laughs> we're not assaulting tonight all right so later on like down the line um Lorraine did become more convinced, you know, of presence of, you know, super, you know. Also, ghosts fun fact, stuff. this apartment has been saged. Awesome. And holy watered. We hit both both sides of my family's religious beliefs. There you go. We've just saged our house multiple times. Got you. So, <laughs> of course, whose people's, you know, whose, people, whose houses they uh they paint it mm-hmm. they wanted to know you know the cause of the haunting or more importantly how does a spirit manifest mm. or where does a spirit come from so that's the like million dollar question isn't it yes where do spirits come from or how do they manifest so there's like in the book there's there's a bit of a rundown of you know of Oh, their Earth, belief system on this? Of earthbound spirits, of, you know, how they believe earthbound spirits, like, manifest themselves. Mm-hmm. So earthbound spirits usually use a human presence to manifest. Um, they, they actually need that. Mm. Um, Ties very much into the poltergeist theory. Yeah. So another way they can manifest is the energy in the atmosphere, which is, like, pretty badass. Like, if there's... Water... <clears throat> Yeah, certain stones, that like sort of thing. Water, or weather, anything that's going on, like nature, they can manifest through nature, and that's awesome. <laughs> I love it. Oh my god! And of course, um, the way they, they, the way that you know, spirits look, the way they actually manifest their bodies, it depends on how the spirit wants to project themselves, or. How they see themselves. I'm glad that you said that. There's one other uh, medium that I watch her show who says the same thing. Yeah. A lot of people are like, it also makes me think about what we talked about last week with the um, the, tri- the witch trials in Scotland mm-hmm. and that that particular woman, the witch, or she wasn't really a witch, but you know what I mean? Yeah. She was killed. She presents herself the way she died. Yeah, Exactly. Um, so that's an interesting choice as to why she does that. And that was, oh my God, I forget what story I was um, telling about. That was Scotland. Yeah, no, not last week. It was a couple weeks ahead of that. Mm-hmm. Um, about a woman in white right. in, in this old rectory. Well, because we kept, because I, I brought up the question of like, why oh. Why are there so many women in white? Yeah, it was, in, it was a Valentine's Day. That's what it was. There you go. And she was a naked ghost. 
Right. And she was, and she, she was, was trying to seduce the priest, right? And she was, she was reliving her happiest moment or one of her happy, you know, uh, the last happiest moment of her life. But yeah, and her name is Amy from the TV show The Dead Files. I forget her last name, but I know her name is Amy. Okay. But she also r- routinely says like the way when she's talking about like the spirits is she's like, he's showing himself to me in this way. Mm. I don't think this is who he really is, but this is how he's presenting himself to me, right. which is an interesting thought process. Cause I figure if you're ethereal in that way, why would you choose to look a certain way? I'd be like, I'm a dragon. <laughs> Someone, some kid would be like, there's definitely a dragon that flies this around is- my bedroom like four times a night. And the, the medium would come into the house and be like, so she's not a dragon. She just really likes that body. <laughs> she's like an, an old lady who just died here. Oh my God. She's harmless to your child. She in fact really likes your kid and that's why she's hanging out there. Yeah, I mean, that would be me as a ghost. That, that is you as a ghost. <laughs> oh my God. Not vengeful at all. No, I would definitely be creepy because I want to scare kids. Oh, uh, what? 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 Because it's fun. Oh my god! <laughs> so, in the book, Ed goes deeper on where one would encounter a ghost. Okay. Um, like old houses or farmhouses, places of history. Yeah. Um, it didn't mention um places that were like you know during world war ii or stuff like that where they were built like on a shoreline houses built on a shoreline for some reason that's a thing Hmm. that was a thing and i'd be interested in reading that part from him yeah um so like i mentioned in episode one episode two and i think Whatever episode I talk about Letta, Letta the the gypsy doll. Oh right. <clears throat> Ghosts can also be attached to objects. Absolutely. So Ed also goes into detail. Ed talks a lot in this book. Let me just. I'm just well, going... the book is called Demonologist, which is his area yeah. of expertise. Let me just tell you, he, he everything is a quote by him. <laughs> I'm not dissing him at all. I'm just saying he talks a lot. Anyway. So it goes in detail about how he and Lorraine received some parts from Flight 401. Um, it's a jetliner that crashed in the Everglades. Mm-hmm. So apparently, as soon as Lorraine touched the piece that they re- they received, she saw the app the I guess the spirit or the apparition of the flight engineer on that plane, and multiple people like throughout however long they had this piece, they would comment and say that there's a guy in like a trench coat pacing out in front of y'all houses and something in front of y'all house, just walking back and forth. And as soon as we get close to him, he disappears. And they're they're like, huh, that's strange. Okay. So (laughs) poor dude probably feels guilty. So I doubt it. Um, so Ed and Lorraine, they finally notice that this guy is the same person that Lorraine saw when she touched a piece of the plane. Mm-hmm. So they come to the, to the conclusion that the reason why he's pacing and waiting outside like in front of the house is because some of his relatives are coming to meet with Ed and Lorraine for oh. like, I guess, a consultation or a meeting. Right, right. And, you know, he wanted to commune with them. So, so he was waiting to be able to talk to, to her. his relatives. And Aww. yeah, I was like, oh my God. Oh, awesome. This is just great. I wish I could see ghosts. Not really. Yeah, I was going to say no, not I really. <laughs> no, I don't. Oh my goodness. So either way, Ed goes in, goes on to talk more about ghosts. And their natures, I guess you could say. Um, he, they they do go into a lot, uh, a little bit on this one too. Like it's just like the the, the was it the second chapter in the book? Oh wow! Talk. Yeah. <laughs> so they're like, this is our backstory. Zooming into the ghost stuff now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Now, Lorraine, back to Lorraine. Um, now, the staple in any good ghost uh, investigation is a medium or clairvoyant. Right. Um, for one, they can actually see what's going on. Mm-hmm. And they can actually see if there's a spirit there. Um, and for two, spirits are naturally drawn to mediums of clairvoyance. And if you're a physical medium, they experience what um, the ghost is trying to express to them. Yeah. So I've heard uh, the lady from the show I like, Amy, talk about how the life expectancy for physical mediums is actually lower. Oh. So you can be a kind of medium who just like hears stuff, Mm -hmm. but like she feels like, so when they're trying to tell her like somebody stabbed me, she is experiencing that moment in that person's life. And so that's a lot of pain and Mm -hmm. trauma to take into yourself. Absolutely. I lost my place. (laughs) So was Lorraine like that or was she more of a head medium? I think she was more of the mental type of medium. Okay, that's good because she did live a nice long life. So I'd hate to think that she spent like 80 years. Yeah. Oh my God. Just experiencing terrible things that happen to people. That's awful. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is what Lorraine did when they investigate houses. They would, you know, she basically like see if there was a spirit she could feel there was one there okay and you know draw it out mm-hmm. if she could and they also say that she used mental telepathy yeah that makes to, sense to communicate with spirits as well so apparently spirits find this the easiest way to communicate right um, if they're i guess an intelligent um ghost or spirit right because we have residual hauntings yes as a thing. yes exactly Sorry. No. <laughs> okay. So as I mentioned before, the Warrens would go to houses where, you know, there were reports of activity happening. Um, you know, just with small stuff. They'd see a ghost here, ghost there, blah, blah, blah. Nothing big. Mm-hmm. Nothing bad. Um, <clears throat> but there were times when they would be called to a house and... The activity of the spirit would be a tad bit more active. Is it that it wasn't actually a spirit? Um. Okay. So they refer. Okay. So in, in the book, they refer to spirits and ghosts as two separate things. So if oh, I, so okay. So you got a ghost, which is um just you know just I guess residual remnant of a yeah human person, and then you have a spirit, which is actual like a. I guess a not physical manifestation, but like a you know a manifestation of something. Well, then, what does he think of about? I mean, he's he, the book is called Demonology, right? What does he think of non-human entities then? Getting there, okay. <laughs> I just now I'm just intrigued by his like his perspective on this. Right, right, right. Okay, so let me see where was I at. Um. Oh yeah, and yeah, the, the, the things would be you know more active, and the occupants would be going out of their minds. You know, they'd be they'd be terrified. Mm-hmm. Um. And like during during these times, people didn't fully understand what was happening, or <laughs> I'm or, not really surprised by that. Or 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 they didn't know. I mean, can you imagine, like? Every time, like, you're some, like, middle-aged housewife in, like, the really nice area of Connecticut, Mm -hmm. right? And whenever you wake up at 327 and you're like, I'm really thirsty, and you go downstairs to get a drink of water, all of the drawers in your kitchen are open. And you're just like... I'm just going to close these and get my wall. You don't like, what's your frame of understanding for this? Like, why does this happen every day at three in the morning? Oh my God. I mean, it happens at my house too, but it's only because a roommate is a child. No, 
Oh, you mean your other roommate? Yeah. I thought you were talking about the kids just going down to the kitchen to grab stuff. No. <laughs> She likes to leave the cabinets open. Oh, okay. <laughs> and not shut them and walk away from them. And then, and then you then, walk downstairs and you're like, is this a ghost? Yes, all the time, too. I do it all the time. Oh, I'm like, no. I'm like, why are all the cabinets open? Is there a ghost in here now? Oh, no. There oh. was in her closet, in your yeah. roommate's closet. So before I get any further into this, I'm going to just run back a little bit okay. and say um, that ghost activity or spiritual activity it doesn't happen for everybody right so like if a ghost is actually you know haunting a house one person could experience that haunting Mm -hmm. but another person could not experience that haunting Mm -hmm. i agree with you and it's usually based on the person Mm -hmm. that the haunting is happening to so say if um a ghost they committed you know s word and this person that's being haunted is going through some depression or you know suicidal thoughts and they're like just going through a rough time in their life this spirit would probably like latch onto them and it should be be more um able to show themselves to this person Sorry, that just makes me think about a thing that happened to me. Oh, goodness. And I don't understand why, because it happened immediately after I visited a prison. Maybe you're going to jail. I have never been to prison, <laughs> darling. So. You said you visited a jail. I, yes, Eastern State Penitentiary. You're going to a jail. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just, I was like, that makes me interested in that situation. A, a weird thing happened there and when I got home. Mm. I also then said, you can go home now. You oh, can go back. Someone latched on to you. They wanted, they were like, oh no, you seem, you, you I like you for some reason. Let me follow you for a I was like, bit. you can, you can go home now. <laughs> no, thanks. And then nothing else happened after that. And they went home, I guess. They were like, oh, I guess she doesn't want me around. Okay, fine. I'll go. <sighs> All right. <clears throat> so. Oh, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. People. So, so people, they, 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 like they know, attach to people for different reasons. Yeah. So people, you know, they didn't know what was happening and they really didn't know who they're going to call. Ed and Lorraine. When there was something strange in their neighborhood. Ed and Lorraine. <laughs> or if there was an invisible man sleeping in their bed. Oh they didn't know who they were going to call. Ed and Lorraine. <laughs> the Ghostbusters. What did they have a name for their little organization they created? What was that called? I didn't say in the book. Oh, I, they had some sort of a little organization that they created, and would help people who would help them with their investigations. I forget what it's called. Oh my goodness! Maybe it's in the second half of the book. Yeah. So some. Oh man, I'm gonna go so deep into that. <laughs> That's all right. I'm gonna try my best to make it like just two episodes because oh goodness. Anyway, sometimes they would get you know they would they would be spirits you know or ghosts. Mm-hmm. Um, and other times it would be a little bit more. I'd say maybe on the demonic side a little, a little bit. Um, so people living here, they would end up you know people living in these houses that would you know end up having activity that was going wild well the general consensus when it's demonic is not that the thing is latching on to you because you're going through a hard time oh no 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 no! it's latching on to you because it wants you yeah oh no no before when i was saying it latched on to you that's that's a spirit i'm talking about a spirit okay like when you're in a haunted house an mm-hmm. actual like haunted house not a demonic house no 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 yeah I'm saying, like the the difference there is it's very yeah like if it see. if it's a demon you won't know it's a demon. Uh, <laughs> Not in the beginning, though. I mean, there's stages. There are stages. I think it's like three different stages. Um, oppression is it, there's oppression, um, something else, and then possession. I got the chapters. Hold on. One is like the build up to. So it's infestation. There we go. Infestation, oppression, and possession. I yes. Know. Infestation is when all the weird crap happens. Yes. 
oppression is when it just seems like there's no other way out. Yeah. Some people cave to it and go, fine, whatever, take what you want. Other people try and fight it, bring people in to help them. And then possession is the point of almost no return. Almost. Yes. As you've seen in many exorcist movies. Um, but yeah, people who live in these types of houses end up being physically, mentally attacked by whatever is there. Mm-hmm. Um, they would be worn the fuck down from the activity going on. And that's that's what they call like oppression, that, that factor. They wear you down. Mm-hmm. So the types of spirits that would cause these types of disturbances or like on a whole nother level. Do I even want to know their names? They're just, the question. It's just dem- demons. Okay, good. I was like, please don't get into other names. No, no, no. It's so just... I can fix it on that. <laughs> I'm late sorry. At night. No, these are just demonic spirits. Interestingly enough, <laughs> or, this is the or... one aspect of mm. the paranormal that I am truly afraid of. Okay. Um, but, uh, you could call these demonic or inhuman spirits. Yeah, I would say it's the in, like human spirits. I'm like, you know what? If I see like, hey, Cal, what's up, bud? Mm-hmm. Like walking through my apartment, like whatever. Or like one night I open my door and I just see some random ghost walk by. That, like that's a person. Like that's a person that had human mm-hmm. experiences at some point. Something that's not human at all. Like I said, I watch a lot of different shows and like that lady from Dead Files, Amy, has described so many different things that are inhuman that seem like outrageous. Like at one point, this one family was talking about this being that they saw that was taller than their house. Oh. And like this huge, like black shape that they saw. And she was definitely like, it's something indigenous and it's a part of the land and it's older than anything else. She's like, leave uh yeah i gotta go <laughs> she was like when she talks about those sort of things that's when i get like and the thing that really creeps me out about that show is that she will have a sketch artist draw up the things that she's seeing oh my god no. and they'll be the most bizarre pictures you've ever seen it's not like a sketch artist drawing it's like ghost writing or whatever the heck you call her it's 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 like a ghostly looking thing. Yeah. Sometimes it's a thing standing over their bed with its hand inside of the person that it's no, bothering. Thank you. Stuff like that. Really creepy things. So I'm like, oh, the stuff that is inhuman is where my actual level of fright happens. Okay. But well, I'm like, people, eh. hmm. okay, okay then. Um so these are different from your running the mill ghosts. Um, for one, ghosts naturally That's why scary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, ghosts can be scary to people, too. Just seeing a dead person float around. Come on now. Um, so ghosts naturally manifest at any time of the day. Mm-hmm. Now, these other spirits. Oh, the witching hour. They appear in, I guess, the lack of natural light. So if you're living in like a house that doesn't get a lot of light or sun. Which, interestingly enough, sometimes those houses... Even with the sun shining through the windows, just seem a little darker. Yeah. I wonder why. Because of what's, yeah. <laughs> um, so, these spirits that manifest, they, I guess they manifest as, like, at first they manifest as a black being. Like, not a black person, but like. All, no, I know what you mean. Okay. Very dark, dark being. Shadow. Yes. People. Yes. Um, and something else I read is that these spirits, they feed off of your fear. Mm -hmm. Like the more you're afraid, the stronger they get, the more like the activity intensifies. And after that, it's (sighs) not that fun. Um, so they did notice that a terrible smell would, um, accompany these spirits when they manifest it Is so that the sulfur it would be sulfur nice or rotting flesh oh or i don't know that smell or ex- i don't know that smell to know that the, i'm smelling it or excrement i know that smell though okay so you got you got of, two out of three you get you get your choice you get uh, how do you how does ed know what rotting flesh smells like i don't like? know i guess you could speculate what you know rotting flesh would probably smell like 
So it's going to smell like poop, farts, or some unknown thing we don't know what it smells like yet. There you go. All righty then. Something dying. There you go. <clears throat> so the Warrens would sense the presence of hatred when they, like, Right, when yeah, they, yeah, yeah. When they encounter, you know, the spirits. Mm -hmm. Like, you just, like, sense that as soon as you, like, go in. And most of the times when they were called to these houses that were experiencing this, everything was going haywire. Everything was already off the rails. It was... A house in chaos. Kind of like the way that it worked in The Conjuring. Absolutely. Like By the time that lady tracked Ed and Lorraine down. Yeah, it was already. The, wasn't the family like everyone was sleeping in the living room yes. and they had to like lock. They had to like wrap all of the door handles no or else they would the fly Conjuring open. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Like by the time they called in Ed and Lorraine at that point. It was bad. It's going all sideways. It was bad. It was all bad. Um. So. They counted spirits that were very vulgar. Mm -hmm. They would say not nice things. Yeah. In not nice ways. Mm -hmm. Um, They could like, you could actually hear them speaking to, like they can actually hear them speaking to them about things. Um, oh, and best believe these spirits made themselves known, of course, leaving upside down crosses and writing backward messages in mirrors mm. um in the book it's i don't remember what page but i bet you i could flip to it real quick um that looks like looks like you read the crap out of it anyway um on this page you can see it there's a there's a like on this page it has uh -huh. a word written backwards it says demonic mm. and underneath of it they would like it would even be bold enough to write death to god mm. so uh, also, not just otherworldly, but specifically mad at Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, maybe I've read that book. I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't matter. No, listen. I love <laughs> it. It just, you, you. Oh, my goodness. All right. And, oh, I left the best part for last. Ooh. So these spirits would even leave. How is a bodily waste to be found? Wait, 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 wait. How? I don't know. So it would either be excrement or urine, or even when they like manifested, there would be like either a blood stain or some type of like bodily fluid where they manifested that. Oh, I hate it. I know it's terrible, right? I like listen. Ghostbusters is like ectoplasm. How gross is that? <laughs> Can you imagine? Like you're just listen. I've walked through the house and accidentally stepped on a cat turd mm. because someone didn't like clean the. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine walking through your house and you step on a people turd, but it's a people turd from a ghost <laughs> because you're in a house full of adults, right? And yeah. you're like. Where did this poop come from? And everybody else is like, we don't know. It was the ghost. Or the spirit. Or the demon. That, um, I don't know why that's more offensive to me. Like, I knew you would be upset by that. that that's why I wrote it last. That is the most offensive part of this. That's why I wrote it last. Like, infestation? Okay. Banging on pots and pans. Just being rude. Waking you up in the middle of the night. But leaving behind? That's so nasty. <laughs> And I get it. You're demonic. Blue, whatever. Oh my It's God. just really offensive to me. Yeah. Walking through the house, see a pee pile. Mm, I'd be upset. That's the like the least bothersome out of all of them. I'd still be upset. Yo, but how freaked out would you be if you're like, you wake up one night or you come home from work one night. Mm. You walk into the kitchen. There's just a blood stain in the middle of the floor. You go upstairs. I'd be freaking out first. You go upstairs. You check the children. None of them have any cuts or wounds. Mm. You knock on your roommate's door. Did you cut yourself in the kitchen or something? She's like, nah. You're just like, where did this blood come from? It's just a nice little round circle in the mm. middle of the kitchen. Okay, please don't. Because I got to go home after this. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell a good story, though. Oh, my I? God. Like, that's, like, that's alarming. Yeah. So, indeed, these weren't human spirits they were dealing with. These were 
So these are where their biggest cases come in then. Yes, absolutely. These Um, kinds of cases. These kinds of cases were their biggest cases, I think. Um, Yeah. Amityville was demonic. Mm -hmm. Annabelle Annabelle is has a demonic attachment. Yeah. Conjuring was a demonic entity. Yep. Well, I believe the Conjuring was a demonic entity that was linked to someone who was um, conjuring the occult at her home yeah like and invited things in that then proceeded to like attach to other people who did harm on the same property right line. yeah now this reminds me that's of, why it's called the conjuring i believe the the woman who lived there who was the bad yeah woman mm-hmm. was doing what they threatened women with in the past like yeah. we talked about last episode like witchcraft and stuff like that. she was actually <laughs> you know trying to conjure real stuff yeah now like Got a little more than she bargained for. Yeah, this kind of stuff reminds me of uh, that movie, The Haunting Connecticut. Mm. That was a good one. I like that one, too. Um, where they held seances at this house, at a house that was a morgue at once, too, I think. You know, I once was, well, okay, my childhood church, at one point we bought a building um, and it used to be a morgue. Mm. Never experienced anything there, though. You know, one part I like in the book mm-hmm. is that they mention um, uh, not Houdini, but um, who's the other one? The other magician? Is it Richard Price? Is it Price? Harry Price. Harry Price. Harry Price. Harry Price. Oh, uh, Harry Price. You remember Harry Price? Um, okay. Have you ever seen, um, I guess, Michael Jackson's Thriller? Mm-hmm. He does the voice in that one. Oh, and then Harry Price was in. I don't want to, you know. He, He's another one who was into exposing. Yeah, absolutely. Mediums, mm-hmm. and he he also was. He's in loads a, of books too. Yeah, he he's a writer. He was in a lot of uh, shows too, and I very I very specifically remember him uh, being a character in the Scooby Doo. Oh, really? At one time. Like this new Scooby Doo movies or whatever the heck they called it was Scrappy, and it was, it's funny because it was Scrappy, uh, Daphne, Scooby, and I think Shaggy was in it too with uh, Harry Price, mm-hmm. and they just go investigating stuff. No Fred, no Velma. Oh, here's the thing. So did he connect with them? I believe he did. I know. I know they mentioned him once in the. Book. I would love like. T- Really know look, his per know his look. I'm going into Harry Price and I'm going to Houdini eventually, like down the road. I'm going oh to, yeah. I'm I'm going to start talking. I'm going to talk about those because I I just find that era quite hilarious. Um, I just think it's great that Harry Houdini was like, I'm going to do tricks, and then somebody like some medium was like. Yes, I know your mother. And he got so mad that he devoted like the next 20 years to exposing fake mediums because one of them tried to like profit off of his like mother dying. And from that point on, like that is just some serious outrage. He was mad. He he's he's one of those cases where you thrive out of spite yep that was out of spite he was like how dare you try and use my own mother against me he was mad so okay and then i didn't write too much after this um so the warrens they would do their best to Mm -hmm. stay away from you know these kind of cases demonic cases because they were new and they didn't know that much about them but they did you know they did still do um like research about them Mm-hmm. Um, and these entities are actually what I will be talking about next week on part two. Oh, that's going to be, <clears throat> I'll have to find another positive person or, you know, person to make us happy next week. Because, I'm, because I, just, I told you that's the only stuff that makes me, gives me the spooks. I'm going to be going into the demons, demons and some possessed things and some hauntings. whenever anybody says demons i think about buzzfeed unsolved and i think about shane bidet with his glasses hey demons 
it's me, your boy. Oh my god. <laughs> That's like the best quote from that entire like eight seasons they have of making stuff. It's me, your boy. Oh my god. And you know he what's funny? That's what a great like. That's a great series too. A yeah. skeptic and a believer. Yeah, I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty still on the fence of. I mean, I believe, but I don't believe. Um, pretty. Anyway, no, um, I believe. I believe. I, on the way here, I actually like, coincidentally, NPR was talking about demons in the scientific community. Mm-hmm. Community. Oh my god, I cannot talk. Um, and how I guess there are different types of demons, but they're not. Is oh, that different? Loads. Yeah. So it's a different type of demon that scientists like refer to. I'm interested in this. Yeah. Um, I'm literally going to Google NPR demon when we're do. done. It, it was on this morning and it came on tonight too because mm, they, re- you know, they replay stuff. It's almost, you yeah, know, that's right. some listen- sort of divine providence. Yeah, that's right. Listen to NPR. Fight me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was just like demons and scientific technology and how it helps somehow. But yeah. Um, but that's all I have for this week. Um, sorry to leave you guys hanging. I could talk about more, but I am going to leave it there. Yeah, we already hit a two hour mark. Are you serious? Yes, we did. Oh my God. This was us rambling and talking about other stuff. That's all right. <laughs> that's what the people are here for. Oh my goodness. But yeah, thanks so much for listening as usual. Yes. Uh, yes. If you happen to listen, all, listen to all the way here, you might as well drop a review for us on Apple Podcasts cuz obviously you are one of the the real deal hardcore followers <laughs> of this content if you've made it to the 2 hour and 5 minute mark. I do apologize for talking so much. Nice. Um but yeah, leave that rate and review. Um what else? If you want to send us a voicemail, you can go Right, to- you can do that anchor.fm/when killers get caught. As soon as you go on the main page, there'll be a little chat box you can click that and leave us a voicemail yep and you can also send us emails at cult podcast at gmail.com absolutely um you can find miss Brittany on tiktok always at, at caught podcast i'm gonna try and get brian on there with me yeah and uh if you would like to hear more of us talking to each other uh brian streams on twitch at foxy trainer and i give delightful commentary while he plays games yes i'm currently playing omori um i'm not sure how long this game is but i'm yeah we've it's going on for six a while. hours in yeah. yeah i know right i just met pluto <laughs> <laughs> and all pluto wants is to be free to travel how he wants to the oh, universe that's such a touching story my god Love but it. thanks so much for listening i hope wherever you happen to be this uh has brought you some joy. Yes. And if you hated it, I am sorry. That's true. But <laughs> have a good night wherever you are in the world or a good day. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye.